Habakkuk chapter 2. And we're going to start at verse 1. Habakkuk chapter 2, starting at verse 1. When you find it, say amen. Habakkuk chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Okay, I'll start reading. It says, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And the Lord answered me and, he said, and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables or tablets that he may run that readeth it. Mm-hmm. Verse 3, For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. And Habakkuk was one of the minor prophets. He was one of the, and the reason why they call him minor prophets not, is not because they were less than the other prophets. It's because the prophetic utterances that they had and, uh, and, the, and, the, and the ministry that they had was not as long as the other prophets like Jeremiah or Isaiah. It was over a brief, well, more brief period of time. Um, but it doesn't make their prophecies any less or make their words any less uh, but that's why they call him minor prophets. So Habakkuk was one of the minor prophets. And <clears throat> Habakkuk was discouraged. He was discouraged because he saw how even the righteous were suffering. And it seemed like he said, okay, Lord, why are the people that love you suffering? Why are the people that serve you suffering? Why are the people that are going uh, you know, to bat for you and not giving up on you and, and serving you. Why are they suffering? Why are the, the, the wicked prospering? And I think sometimes that's, that can be a, a discouraging thing when you watch somebody that you know is just living foul, but it seems like they got everything they need. And it, it can get discouraging. But Habakkuk asked God a question. He asked God a question. He said, I, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower. So he was, Habakkuk was positioning himself spiritually to hear from God. And a lot of times we say we want to hear from God, but then when God starts talking and saying some things, it's like, oh, I wasn't ready for that. But Habakkuk was ready for it. Habakkuk was like, okay, Lord, whatever you got to say to me, I'm a man up and I'm going to take it. And he says, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me. And what I shall answer when I am reproved. Notice he said when I am reproved. Because what Habakkuk was saying was, Lord, even if it's something I don't want to hear, I'm going to take it. Even if it's correction, I'm going to take it. Even if it's something that's going to, you know, spank my hands, I'm going to take it. Because he was ready for reproval. And the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain upon tables. That he may run that readeth it. And so... The Lord, one thing about God, God doesn't just want to rebuke us and reprove us. He wants to guide us. He wants us to have purpose. He wants us to have plans. And he wants us to have power. Purpose, plans, and power. I want you to think about that. Purpose, plans, and power. God has a purpose for all of us. And the thing about it is, he didn't just want Habakkuk to feel good or, or, or get, get an answer that was going to make him grin. But he wanted Habakkuk to, to get something that was going to help him the rest of his life. And, and he said, you know, write the vision and make it plain. Now, there's another scripture in Proverbs that says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. And it says, where there is no vision, the people perish. So something we need to understand about God. God doesn't want us in the dark. God doesn't want us confused. God doesn't want us to be unaware of his activities. He wants us to be a part of it. And in order for that to happen, God has to give us a vision. Well, what is a vision? A lot of times when people hear the word vision, they think, you know, uh, maybe God woke you up 3 o'clock in the morning and, and was sitting in the chair staring at you or, or you got some kind of dream that, that, that taught you some deep spiritual thing. But really, what a vision encompasses is, is direction. You know, 
God wants us to have direction. He wants us to have guidance. He wants us to have purpose. And unless you have purpose, then our life doesn't have a whole lot of meaning. If you ever noticed, there are a lot of people that seem like when they, when they, when they lose their purpose, they die. You know, or when they lose the reason for living, they die. I mean, I looked at George W. H. W. Bush when he died. I knew he wasn't going to live long because his wife went, and it's, it, that, that was his best friend. They were together. This whole from the time he was a 17-year-old fighter pilot in World War II. In fact, he loved her so much he put her name on the plane. It was right there, Barbara. Barbara, look up under where he sat in the cockpit. He wrote Barbara right up under there. So I knew that it wouldn't be too long after that that woman died that he was going to leave too. And that's how it is. When, when our purpose, our reason for living seems to vanish, then it's time for us to go too. Same thing with Moses. You know, uh, Moses led the children of Israel as far as he could. But it wasn't for Moses to take them into the promised land. God needed another type of person to take them into the promised land. And that was Joshua. And Mo Moses waved at him. Moses saw him walking in. But it was, God said, okay, Moses, it's time for you to come home. And so vision is wrapped around purpose. But it's not just purpose without a plan. The purpose has to have a plan. And with the plan, you have to have power, all right? It, it'd be one thing to say, okay, I, I give you a purpose, but if you don't have a plan to make the purpose come to fruition, then, then you're just a person with a piece of paper with, 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 a, with an idea, all right? You know, Thomas Edison had an idea, but it wasn't until somebody said, okay, you need to get a bulb and you need to get some filament, you need to get some electricity, and then there came a light bulb. But until he had all the elements, it was just an idea. God wants us to have more than just an idea. He wants us to be able to run with that idea. And that's what vision, a vision and purpose, it starts with a purpose. God gave, a, gave, gave uh, the children of Israel a purpose. Their purpose was to be a light to the world, to show the world that he was the God of creation. But they blew it. Because instead of them embracing the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they strayed away and they went into apostasy. And they weren't a light to the world. Then here comes Jesus, the light of the world. Jesus had 12 disciples. He gave those 12 disciples a purpose. He told them their purpose right when he met them. He said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. That was the purpose. But there had to be a plan to go with the purpose. And the plan came in those three years, Jesus taught them how to fulfill that. Those three years they spent with Jesus, Jesus taught them how to enact that thing. And then the power came in Pentecost. So we have purpose, plan, power. Without those three things, no vision will come to pass. Because if you don't have a purpose, then you might as well not, you know, I hear people all the time, I want to be a preacher, why? I want to be a pastor. Why? Why would anybody want to be a pastor? I'm not being serious. <laughs> Y'all laugh. <laughs> because if God calls you to be a pastor, then he's going to give you the power and the plan to get it done. Yes, yes, yes. Now, that's not easy. My wife can tell you better than probably anybody in here how hard that is. Amen. Amen. It's not easy. See, a lot of times people think being a pastor just means I got to stand up and preach every Sunday. I wish it was that simple. I wish it was that simple. That would be great if I could just do that every week. Yeah, but we don't, we, we don't have that luxury. You know, if there's poop on the steps, pastor got to clean it up. You know, pastor got to make sure that there's heat. Pastor got to make sure that whatever. I mean, there's more to it than just standing up and preaching. And it gets discouraging sometimes when you're a pastor because sometimes things don't work the way you think they should work or as fast as you think. But... It goes back to the other P's. Purpose, plan, power. We have to have a plan. And without a plan, where, where there's no vision, the people perish. Where, where there's a lack of knowledge, people perish. Both of those things are encompassed in vision. Because with a vision, you get knowledge. God doesn't just give visions to have people wake up in the middle of the night, oh, I saw God. No, there's more to it than that. God wants you to have a plan. And that's why it says here in Habakkuk, write the vision and make it plain, meaning make it easy to understand. God doesn't want us confused. He wants, you know, I'm going to tell you, we serve a God that's very simplistic. You know, we're the ones that complicate religion and faith. God makes it simple. Let me give you an example of that. The man in jail in Acts chapter 16 said, what must I do to be saved? 
Paul said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. Now, that happened one of us. You need to go down to the local church and get at the altar and tarry for three days. Or you need to, you know, you need to speak in tongues. Or you need to roll on the floor six times and blow bubbles. Or you need to get baptized in the name of Jesus. You need to put on the right kind of clothes. You can't be saved unless you got a suit and tie on. You can't be saved unless you got a long skirt and a doily on your head. Paul didn't say that. He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. We're the ones that complicate the vision and purpose of God. Mother was talking about the, the, the Great Commission in her prayer. I believe she mentioned the Great Commission in her prayer. That is the true vision and purpose of the church, to win the lost. Now, we do have to have a plan with that. You know, when are you going to go out and witness? How are you going to go witness? What tools are you going to use? Are you going to teach people and have a discipleship class? Are you going to have a new converse class? That's a part of the planning. But the vision is, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Jesus taught them how to be fishers of men. And that's one of the things that I, as your pastor, I haven't been as good as I should be with that. I've been, I've been, I've been slack. Because part of my job is to teach you guys how to win the lost. And I haven't been doing a good job. And you say, all the Stevens, how you know you haven't been doing a good job? Because the church is empty. Yeah. And I'm not putting all the blame on you. Some of that goes on me. Yeah. And so the, uh, one of the things I, I want to say is that going into this new year, there's going to be a lot of changes in Mount Calvary. A lot of changes. And it, it, it ain't all going to be pleasant. You ain't going to all like it. But we got to make some changes. Because in order for us to be effective, in order for us to be fruitful and not like that fig tree that Jesus cursed, then we got to step up and do some things. Do some things that we haven't been doing. Amen? One of the things... And it came up in Sunday school this morning. And, I, and I'm almost finished because we got to get to this meeting. It's freezing here. But one of the things that came up in Sunday school this morning, we, um, uh, Mother Joyce was teaching and she was talking about why people sometimes don't want to go to church and why young people in particular. And my thing is this. Jesus said something that I think we miss because we complicate faith again. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw... How many men? Young people? Black people? White people? Hispanic? Asian? All men. So, something's wrong here. Either we're not lifting Jesus up or Jesus is a liar. Yeah, he ain't a liar. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw, not us, I will draw all men unto me. And that's where we're lacking. Because the vision, the original vision plan that God gave the disciples, follow me and I'll make a vision, man. If you're not doing it, you ain't catching no fish. If you ain't lifting him up, he ain't drawing all men. Now, this is the million dollar question. How do we lift Jesus up? Good question. How do we lift Jesus up? I'm asking a question. I want y'all to shoot some answers at me. Huh? Spread the gospel, what else? Prayer, what else? Show love, what else? Obedience, witnessing, what else? Respect, what else? Y'all are missing one vital one. And all those were good answers, but there's one vital one we're missing. Starts with the letter W. Worship. Yeah. Now, most people that know me would say my number one answer would be witnessing, because I love witnessing. But I'm going to tell you why worship is so important. Because that's how we lift him up. We honor his name. We give him praise. That's worship. That, that's, that, that's the thing that touches the heart of God. That's why a lot of times when the children of Israel won battles, it wasn't because they had a big army, because they didn't. It wasn't because they had good soldiers, because they didn't. It wasn't because they had courageous kings, because most of them weren't. But it was because the tribe of Judah went first and they worshiped God. Worship is what puts the devil to flight. Submit yourself therefore to God. Resist the devil and flee. See, that's one of the reasons why sometimes, and, 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 and my wife and I, we think about this all the time. We talk about it all the time. So it ain't nothing we ain't see, heard, you ain't heard us say. But sometimes coming into Mount Calvary is like a funeral. Because we, we just don't praise God. 
Every now and then we'll, 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 we'll get a glimpse of, of, of how we should do it. And, and, but for the most part, we just come in here and we just kind of, you know, we want to pass the time and get up out of here as fast as possible. As long as we have that attitude, things ain't going to get no better. Now, you might say, well, Elder Stevens, I can't sing. I didn't say you had to be able to sing. Everybody can't sing like Mother Ruth and Sister Yolanda. Amen. Lord knows I can't. Well, worship ain't about singing. Worship is about your attitude. Thank you, Jesus. Do you have an attitude of worship? Do you come in here thinking about how good God's been to you? Do you come in here thinking about how worthy God is of your praise? Do you come in here thinking about, I, I could care less about the problems while, when I walk out that door. Right now, God, this is your time. This is your time, God. And if you don't come in here thinking like that, this is God's time, then things ain't going to get better. Because you have to set the atmosphere of worship in order for certain things to take place. And I thank God for my wife, because she says, she reminds me of this all the time, and I don't want her to ever think that I'm not paying attention to her, because I do. She, 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 she says things to me, and I need to hear it. Might not always respond, but I'm going to tell you something. One of the reasons why we don't see the deliverances and the, and the demons fleeing is because when, you, when the attitude is an attitude of worship, the devil can't take it. He don't want to be in here when you're worshiping Jesus. No. And, 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 and there's three things, well, two things in particular, they both start with W, so think about it. The worship and the word are the two things that the devil doesn't want in church. When you're worshiping God and the word is going forth, the devil ain't going to be here. But we got to do better, saints. It starts with me. It starts with my wife. So I'm not putting the blame on everybody else. But I, I do not want to come into church, Mount Calvary, whether it's here or another building, but wherever we're at, and, and it's empty as it is. Now, this is the question I have to ask the church. If you want to see people saved and you want to see people delivered, and we're not bringing people to the place where they can get it, then why? Is it because this is not a, it's like, for example, I, I, would t I used to tease my wife. I said, if I get shot, send me to Cooper. But anything else to another hospital. Because some hospitals are better than for other things, you know. But is there something wrong with this hospital that we don't bring people here? Then if it is, then we need to fix it. You know, every year at the hospitals I work at, they, they, do, they, 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 they pay millions of dollars to consultants to figure out why they're, they're getting lower ratings and why they're not getting the, the you know, because it's a competition. Virtual does it. Cooper does it. Uh, all the hospitals do it. They, they, got, they need to get these consultants with these big briefcases and they come in, well, you need to do this, you need to do that, stop doing this, or whatever. Well, sometimes I think churches need to do that. But, but before we go send out for a million dollar consultant, let's look at Jesus as a consultant. What, what would Jesus do to fix a church that's not meeting the needs of the community? What would Jesus do to help a church that's not being fruitful? Well, let's look at some things Jesus did. Some of the things that Jesus did, one of the things he told the disciples, he had to remind them, you know, about when I leave here, you're going to do greater works than I did. He told them that. But what were some of the works that they did? They fed the hungry. They cast out devils. They laid hands on the sick. They encouraged people. They raised the dead. I mean, they, they, the list goes on. Now, you might say, well, Elder Stephen is raising the dead. Well, think about it like this. You may have never raised a dead person off the grave, and you may never. But God wants us to have the mentality and the confidence in him that he can do whatever he has to get done. Because it ain't about us. When I'm in the hospital and I'm praying for people, you know, I don't have no power in my hand to raise nobody above their sick bed, but I believe Jesus can. And so that's why you got to go to the hospitals. You got to go to the prisons. You got to go to the nursing homes. You got to go into the community. Because if you take that belief that Jesus is, is, is the one that can do it, then that's all we need. You, you don't have to, there ain't no power in my hands. Elder Stevens, I ain't like Reverend Ike. Reverend Ike used to have a gold glove on, and let me touch you with this gold glove, and you know, and you'll be healed. I ain't got no gimmick like that. What I do have is faith in Jesus Christ. And that's what we gotta do, saints. Write the vision, make it plain, and run with it. Then what is the vision? Fishmen. We gotta be fishers of men. We gotta lift him up. That's the purpose. The plan, how we're gonna get it done.
throughout the year. I thank God for my wife again. Every month my wife labors on, we're making a calendar. I'm going to tell you something. Those calendars are going to become the biggest part of our new year. Because we're going to plan how to do it and we're going to implement it. All right? We're supposed to go to Ronald McDonald House at the end of the month? 29th. Well, y'all need to be thinking about that right now and, and, and how we're going to we gonna help First Lady get it done and not wait till the last minute, and, you know. And I'm going to tell you something else. Y'all get mad I say this too. The, the first priority for ministry is, is in this church. Now, people get upset. If, I, if we got an outreach on that day and they're having a concert for the district, guess where I'm going to be at? Ronald McDonald House. You hear what I'm saying? Now, that doesn't mean I don't like the district or the jurisdiction, but would you take your food and feed somebody else's kids and have yours home not eaten? Y'all say amen if y'all play, you agree with me, amen? So we, we, gotta, we, gotta, we gotta make it happen here. We gotta make it happen here. This, this community is, is, is in bad shape. Yes, sir. I mean, the kids getting killed and people overdosing and people getting raped and people getting... I mean, I, I was driving on Haddon Avenue to get a haircut. They had the whole block taped off because they was out there shooting on, on, on Haddon and Kane Avenue. Yeah. But the church is here to make an effect on that kind of stuff. I'm not waiting for the Republicans or the Democrats to fix our community. No, sir. Because Jesus gave us what we need to fix it. He gave us the purpose, the plan, and the power. That's all we need. The purpose, the plan, and the power. Amen? Amen. 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 Get a Lord a hand.